Thank you, Megan, for that lovely and generous introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be with everyone here today, and it's really been a fantastic and productive week here in Nashville working on the installation of the Wiener, Ver Wiener Werkstätte Postcards exhibition. I've greatly enjoyed my time spent working alongside various colleagues here at the Frist, and would like to extend a special thanks, um, first and foremost, to the director, Susan Edwards, who had the foresight to reach out to us and the Leonard Lauder office to um, work on this collaboration together. To everyone on the curatorial side, Mark Scala, Trinita Kennedy, and Katie Del May. Um, on the registrarial and exhibitions team, um, we had the great pleasure of working closely with Richard Feaster, Scott Tome, um, Michael Bregner, um, and certainly my other curatorial colleagues, Silvia Brizioni and Linda Klitsch. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with you both, and I've enjoyed all of our time um, collaborating. And finally, um, there have been so many other people here at the Frist who have made our visit very hospitable and gracious. It certainly speaks to the Southern hospitality that I feel so proud of as a native Southerner myself. So thank you to everyone who I did not mention but has been part of this wonderful um, collaboration. So as Megan said, my talk um, accompanies the exhibition opening today to the public postcards of the Wiener Werkstätte. And the Wiener Werkstätte or Vienna Workshops was an arts and crafts collaborative that existed um, from 1903 until 1932. And as many have already commented, it is quite fitting that an exhibition on postcards is being held in this wonderful Art Deco building, the former main post office for Nashville. Sorry, <laughs> um, the Wiener Werkstätte ironically went bankrupt just at the same time that this building was being made. Um, the workshops closed uh, sadly in 1932 um, after their nearly 30 years existence. So there is some sort of irony, I think, that they were ending just as this incredible space was going up. I will begin by briefly examining where and when postcards originated, and then I'll set the stage by briefly looking at the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Fond de Siecle, Vienna. This polyglot empire, in fact, was teeming with cultural talent and gave rise to a true renaissance in many fields, certainly philosophy, the sciences, arts, architecture, and design, and it provided the ideal setting for the rise of a radical modern movement that was fully embodied in the birth of the Vienna Secession and shortly thereafter the Wiener Werkstätte itself. Postcards were produced by the Wiener Werkstätte for nearly a dozen years and proved to be one of the most popular products that they created. They were affordable exemplars of design and truly suitable for any occasion. And I will um, give you kind of a quick survey of the wide variety of subjects that they covered and also discuss some of the artists behind these inventive designs. So almost 150 years ago, the first widely circulated postcard was issued by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was dubbed a correspondence carta and it was basically a letter telegram. The words Correspondence Carta, you can see at the top, were printed above the emblem of the empire, the double-headed eagle, on a very thin piece of cream cardstock that measured 8.5 by 12.2 centimeters, very close to the 3.5 by 5 inch size that we are accustomed to today. And space was provided here on, on the card beneath that name and the emblem for the address of the recipient. Conveniently, these cards came pre-stamped with the necessary postage, true kreutzer, and the stamp featured the head of the emperor, Franz Josef. The verso of the card had blank space where any message um, could be written, and also with a short notice, releasing the post office for, from all responsibility for the contents contained therein. <laughs> Suspect it was added by the legal counsel. Um, the correspondence card, in fact, proved to be wildly successful, with an estimated 9 million cards sold the first year alone. And it was hailed as a triumph of democracy, really, because it brought postal services within the reach of the masses by dramatically reducing the cost of postage and also by ensuring a uniform rate. Just as with postal rates today, cost to mail a letter or a card previously would have been determined by the distance it was being sent and by its weight. Um, and has been, has, has been mentioned in some of the tours that have taken place in conjunction with the show. These first cards had no decoration other than that emblem. So they were very plain. This slide, I think, needs no explanation, um, but really to try to provide a context for you know, what the postcard was thought about when it was first created. Um, it's very much like a text message that you might send to a friend, um, a family member, um, or like any sort of social media missive. So a post on Facebook, 
Instagram, Twitter. These were swift and concise ways to communicate and share information. And this is how postcards were um, in initially received and accepted. Austrian economist Emanuel Hermann is widely credited with inventing the postcard. He studied law at the University of Vienna, so I told you there was a lawyer involved <laughs> in this equation. And after graduation, he entered civil service career working as a professor of economics at Vienna's Institute of Technology. In January of 1869, he published an article in Austria's leading newspaper called the Neue Freie Presse, or the New Free Press, where he recommended that all envelope-sized cards with 20 words or less, so again, like a, a tweet almost, should only cost two kreuzer. And regular letter postage at this time was five kreutzers, so that meant it was less than half of what it would have cost for a typical letter. He argued there would be economic advantages to releasing such a card, and essentially the Austro-Hungarian uh, postmaster general agreed with him, embraced the idea, and by October of that year, the first correspondence cards were produced by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They could be delivered anywhere within the empire, irrespective of distance, for that two kreutzer price. And after not too long, that 20-word minimum was dropped. Now, I should mention that Hermann's role as the inventor of the postcard has been contested by some. There were proposals in other countries, such as Germany, to offer a postcard-type mail service prior to this time. And in fact, privately printed postcards had been in circulation since at least the 1860s, and some might even point to early examples in France from the late 18th century. But these were typically produced by businesses and as a means of advertisement. But what Harriman can certainly be credited for is the notion that a government should release these cards at a standard size and with the pre-printed postage incorporated therein. And clearly the Austro-Hungarian um, government thought that he had a seminal role in this invention as it released this Jubilee card on the 25th anniversary of the release of the correspondence card. Not sure. Oh, there we go. Um, now, Harriman's article and the release of these first government issued cards had wide reaching and quick ripple effects. In Great Britain, two um, magazines, the Journal of Arts and the Manufacturer and Builder, very soon after this article was, was released, covered this new postage style, writing, and here I quote The Austrian government has introduced a novelty in postage, which might be introduced with great benefit in all countries. The object is to enable persons to send off with the least possible trouble messages of small importance without the trouble of obtaining paper, pens, and envelopes. Cards of fixed size are sold at all post offices for only two kreuzer, one side being for the address, the other for the note, which may be written either in ink or with any kind of pencil. These are thrown into a box and delivered without envelopes. A half penny post of this kind would certainly be very convenient, especially in large towns, and a man of business carrying a few such cards in his pocketbook would find them very useful. There is an additional advantage attaching to the card, namely that of having the address and postmark inseparably affixed to the note. And that ends the quote. By 1870, and just as these journalists had urged, in fact, postcards were available in various parts of Germany, but without the pre-affixed stamp, in Britain and in Switzerland. And by 1871, other countries had followed suit, including Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Canada. And by the mid-1870s, many other countries had jumped on, including Russia, Chile, France, Algeria, Spain, Serbia, Romania, and Italy. Now, the US, was also an early adopter of the postcard. As early as February of 1861, the US Congress permitted mailing privately printed cards that weighed one ounce or less for up to 1,500 miles for only one cent. And larger distances required two cents of postage. So being a very entrepreneurial society, um, John Carlton uh, obtained a copyright and sensing an opportunity to produce privately printed postcards. But he soon sold that copyright to um, H.P. Lippmann, who began producing and selling um, postal cards, and you can see an example of that at the top, which he called Lippmann's postal cards. These were non-pictorial, and postage did have to be added by the sender. Many do consider Lippmann to be the father of the modern postcard because he predates Emanuel Hermann by eight years. But really, regardless of who deserves credit, by 1873, the US government followed in the footsteps of its European counterparts and began issuing these government-issued cards with the postage pre-affixed. 
And we see an example of that at the bottom. Now, initially postcards were limited to domestic distribution, but soon it became evident there was tremendous need and demand for this type of communication to be international, and also for the need for it to be regulated. A universal postal union was formed in the mid-1870s, and international delivery of postcards soon became possible. By 1878, they had set the standard size for postcards, which is that three and a half by five centimeters, and that is the size of most of the Wienerberg set of postcards that you'll see in the exhibition upstairs, except for the oversized cards, for example. And by 1886, it was agreed that postcards could be circulated internationally. And of course, with that possibility, there was greater demand. Now, kind of simultaneous with the rise of the regulation of postcards um, and also the agreement that they could be distributed um, across national borders, that we'd start to see dramatic changes in how postcards appeared. So images begin to be added as well. And part of this has to do with um, dramatic changes in printing capabilities and technologies. So the first postcards were um, uh, monochromatic, so you would have images often produced through a printing process, perhaps from a photograph that had been reproduced as a photographeur, but with no color um, incorporated in the card. But with advances in the 1890s, we start to see the rise of chromolithography, so color could be incorporated um, in the designs as well. And many of these were really intended to advertise world's fairs or national expositions or important events in um, people's lives. And also businesses certainly recognize the possibilities of these type of illustrated postcards as quick and inexpensive ways to um, advertise their products. So now to narrow our focus to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Habsburg rule began in Central Europe in the late 13th century. And from 1804 until 1867, this region was known as simply the Austrian Empire. But following the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867, it became a dual monarchy with Hungary retaining a degree of self-governance. And at one point, in fact, the Austro-Hungarian Empire spanned 20% of Europe and was the second largest European country behind the Russian Empire. Vienna was, by 1900, the fourth largest capital in Europe, um, just behind London, Paris, and Berlin. But despite the sort of distinguished um, nature of its size um, and prominence, it was in many ways provincial. The phrase Kaiserlich und Königlich, or imperial and royal, was applied to the joint monarchy that was held between Austria and Hungary. And this got quickly abbreviated because German words are often very long um, and they like these little abbreviations. So Ka und Ka, you'll often see um, attached to the names of businesses that might make clothes for the court or pastry or whatever it might be. And that would even be further abbreviated just Ka Ka which um, led the writer Robert Musil to mock this abbreviation, um, he coming up with the word Kakania to describe the imperial empire. Um, and he used this in his novel, The Man Without Qualities, as a way to sort of poke fun at the bureaucratic and highly stratified society that existed under Habsburg rule. Now the emperor Franz Josef um, assumed the throne in 1848. He was only 18 years old, and he remained there until his death in 1916, so just before the end of World War I. And in many ways, he embodied the reluctance by some to embrace change. He resided in the Imperial Hofburg, and you see a view of that um, on the right, which is situated in the heart of the first district, and it was the seat of Habsburg power for more than six centuries. And today it functions largely as a museum space. In fact, the CC Museum is located I'm in Hofburg now. The governor, um, sorry, the emperor governed a multi-ethnic nation with a blend of Western and Eastern cultural traditions where at least 10 languages were spoken, including German, Hungarian, Czech, and Slovak. And this nation would be transformed um, under his rule despite his um, hesitations to some degree. Now his old fashioned preferences meant that in some ways the empire um, did lag behind its European counterparts. And to just give some example to his personal tastes, he favored sleeping on an iron bed his entire life and also favored simple fare, even though he could have obviously afforded any kind of food that he wanted. So his favored meal was said to be boiled beef and beer in fact. He rose at 4 a.m. every day and quickly set to work. As you can imagine, there were tremendous amounts of legislation and other um, matters that had to be addressed by him personally. We also know that he abhorred modern architecture. For those of you who might have been to the Hofburg or are familiar with Vienna, just across from the Hofburg in 1909, Adolf Loos 
um, constructed or oversaw the construction of what is known as the House on McKaylor Plots, which is a lavish uh, building in terms of its marble um, ornamentation with green and gold um, materials being used on the facade, but without any of the ornamental decoration that we see on the front of the um, Hofburg itself. And the emperor was said to have absolutely detested this building and refused to leave the Hofburg thereafter during his lifetime by this particular entrance that we see right here. <laughs> so he made his unhappiness known quite strongly. Now, the emperor was one of only two people that were honored by being depicted on Wienerberg's set of postcards. The only other person who appeared on a postcard was the architect Otto Wagner, who ironically is credited by many as the father of modern architecture in Vienna. So that is quite bizarre that they would, on the one hand, honor this you know, father figure for the nation, but on the other hand, honor the person that they saw as really ushering in the modern age for the, the modern arts and design. These are two designs that were created by Josef Divecki um, that were produced in 1908 in uh, combination with the 60th Jubilee or Diamond Jubilee in celebration of Franz Josef's rule. And we can see with these cards that these have a rather postage stamp-like quality, so very few colors are incorporated. And the one on the left, certainly they look like they could be two miniature postage stamps that are just put on these decorative backgrounds. Um, the card on the left was so appealing, at least at the time that it was created, that Daymal, which is one of the most popular bakery and confectionery stores in Vienna to this day, and it's in fact situated just around the corner from the Hofburg, used this card on one of its candy boxes. And in fact, Daymal um, also continues to reprint some of the Wienerberg set of postcard designs and affixes them to boxes of chocolate and candies. So really, these continue to have a popularity and lifespan more than 100 years after they were created. Divecki had moved to Vienna from Hungary, so it shows kind of that, that breadth of the realm when he was a child, and he studied painting at Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts, and also took classes at the Kunstgewerbeschule, or School of Applied Arts, where he met artists who were affiliated with the Wiener Werkstätte. And soon he was contributing graphic designs not only to the workshops, but to other companies in Vienna. And he offered more than 50 postcard designs um, to the Wiener Werkstätte, including these um, examples that were made for the Jubilee. But he also designed fashion postcards, and some of those are on view upstairs, as well as cards for children and holiday-themed cards. Now in 1857, the Emperor Franz Josef um, did order the destruction of the city's medieval wall, so that does show him sort of emerging to some degree from his more conservative mindset. And this uh, medieval wall was an ancient fortification that had been established to protect Vienna from onslaughts from the Turks and other countries. And the wall was replaced with a grand boulevard encircling the inner city known as the Ringstrasse or Ring Street. And it remains, I think, one of the most attractive boulevards um, in a nation's capital even now. It went up between 1860 and 1890 and was lined with neo-historicist structures in various styles, including neo-Gothic, neo-Renaissance, and neo-Baroque. There was no coherent building program um, for these structures, and many architects, including Otto Wagner, Josef Hoffmann, and others, saw these faux historicist styles as false for their time and argued that it would have been better if buildings had gone up that took into account the way that people truly live today. But it is a metaphor for the Viennese preoccupation with outward appearances that extended really to all classes and walks of life. As the protective wall was dismantled, older structures in many cases were destroyed to make way for the new. And I would say this in some ways gave place gave way to some early preservationist um, inklings in Vienna, because some of the artists associated with the Wiener Werkstätte, such as Edelbilte Kiesewetter, made these postcards that really highlight the beauty of these uh, medieval structures, um, which had sort of uh, made up the inner city of Vienna and some of the outskirts. And I think because of the efforts of Kiesewetter and this photographer, Ogo Stauda, who were trying to document the way that Vienna had existed for more than five centuries, not all of these buildings were torn down. And in fact, um, you can still see some of these um, kind of Warren cobble-lined streets if you walk through particularly the first district even now. 
Now, Vienna experienced remarkable growth really at the dawn of the century and attracted citizens from throughout the empire. In fact, the population expanded dramatically in a 50-year period from 1850 to 1900, increasing from over one half, sorry, from half a million inhabitants to nearly two million during that time. Um, and as I said, what's really fantastic is with the rise of photography, we also see the artists working on the postcards that were trying to um, document some of the dramatic changes that the city was experiencing. Now, some of those who clamored against historicist architecture that was going up in the Ringstrasse and other places were a group of young architects and designers who did want to bring modernity to the nation's capital. And I would argue, and I'm not alone in this, that modernity did come to Vienna with the founding of the Vienna Secession. More properly known as the Austrian Association of United Artists, it was established in 1897 under the leadership of Klimt, and we see him there in one of his ubiquitous painter smocks on the right. The secession um, members included not only painters, but also architects, applied artists, graphic designers, really um, anyone who had studied at either the Academy of Fine Arts or the School of Applied Arts. And these um, young men gave equal value to both the fine and decorative arts, which was a novel idea at this time. The notion of the Gesamtkunstwerk or total work of art in which all elements within a space or an exhibition hall a house, a room, or even a theatrical piece would work together in harmony and cohere in one aesthetic whole was a guiding principle for the secession and then later for the Wiener Werkstätte. The industrialist and major um, art collector Karl Wittgenstein, who was father of Ludwig Wittgenstein, the philosopher, largely financed the construction of the group's first building, which we see on the left, um, which was designed by architect Josef Maria Ulbrich with collaboration from Coleman Moser, who was a graphic and fashion designer who would go on to be a painter. The building went up in six months and was completed in 1898. And it was dubbed a temple to art and was one of the first modern buildings to be erected in Vienna. And many saw it really as a reaction against those faux historicist style structures that I had showed earlier. And in the exhibition in the case called Collector's Albums, you can find three postcards about the Vienna Secession, two showing exterior views and one view um, of one of their exhibitions featuring paintings by Gustav Klimt. Now reactions to the secession were quite mixed. Um, it was quickly dubbed by some the golden cabbage because at the top there you can see this sort of gilt, I mean, trust me, it's gilt, a cupola that was made of uh, laurel leaves that were pierced. Um, there were more sarcastic nicknames though. One was Mahdi's tomb. Uh, another critic called it an Assyrian outhouse. Um, someone else said that it looked like a cross between a glass house and a blast furnace. <laughs> um, so, you know, people weren't quite sure how to react to this very blocky building um, where the only ornamentation that you really see on the facade is applied to the surface instead of being sculptural three-dimensional motifs that are really part of a traditional classical style of architecture. And in fact, the group itself even proudly proclaimed its difference um, on the facade just above the doorway, and it exists there. Today was the group's motto, which had been provided by critic Ludwig Hevesy, which was, der Zeit ihre Kunst, der Kunst ihre Freiheit, or to every age its art and to art its freedom. And this is still a very prominent art exhibiting hall to this day, and, and actually functions quite well. Now, the men who formed this session had several goals for their organization. They um, put placed primary emphasis on the aesthetic of the installations. They wanted paintings to be hung at eye level rather than stacked salon style, such as you see in this interior view. They also argued for a progressive approach, particularly in comparison to the Kunstlerhaus or Kunstlerhaus Genischenschaft, the Austrian Artist Cooperative, which had been established in um, early 1861. And all of the members of the Kunstlerhaus were men, and it was a very private and conservative group that really had very strong ideas about the art that could be shown in their spaces. And because some of the younger members of the Kunstlerhaus that were centered around Klimt objected to their intolerance in considering any modern idea and the lack of cohesion in its exhibitions or the consideration given to aesthetics in its displays, they decided they really needed to break away and form their own art exhibition space. So as I had said, really, with the secession, Vienna enters the modern age just on the cusp of the new century. Um, 
it aimed to, the secession members aimed to make Vienna more cosmopolitan, partly by exhibiting work from other European countries, but also by providing a place where not only artists could see work by their fellow colleagues, but also where collectors and the public would have the chance to see leading developments from other nations. The first secession exhibition was actually not held in the secession building because it was not yet completed. So they rented space in the Vienna Horticultural Society, which was located just off the secession. And the show took place between March and June. And notably, the emperor, um, Franz Josef, came himself. Not quite sure how he reacted. Um, but we do know that some critics were very favorable. And clearly, a lot of um, museum colleagues collectors and others were quite taken because of the more than 500 works on view, more than half of them sold. And I can say that a number of these did enter the collection of the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna, and they have some of them on view now. So it was a way for them also to begin to acquire things for their holdings and to show the students at the School of Applied Arts um, what their counterparts in other nations were making. Now fortunately, reactions to the secession's exhibitions were more favorable than to the building. The secession played a seminal and defining role, in fact, in the shape of modernism in Austria in the early 20th century. And in the years that Klimt and his colleagues were affiliated with the secession, they held 23 major exhibitions in those first seven years, and they included a wide range of work. Everything from, on the left, I'm showing pages from the eighth Vienna secession exhibition held in 1900, which was largely devoted to contemporary decorative arts, but there were fine arts on display as well, primarily works from the arts and crafts movement were included in this exhibition, but they also held shows on Art Nouveau or Jugendstil um, style works, as well as post-impressionist paintings from France and Italy and other countries, as well as exhibitions devoted to the arts of Japan, which did prove to be highly influential to graphic design in particular um, at this period in many countries. Now, despite the secession's commercial and critical success, it was not without scandal, and in fact, scandal from the very beginning almost. Because with Klimt's first poster design, um, critics said it was indecent. It depicted a scene from Greek mythology showing Theseus slaying the Minotaur, which he chose very deliberately to symbolize the struggle of the new generation in revolt against the old. But the censors did not approve of his work because Klimt had portrayed Theseus in the nude. Um, and they said that he could not release this uh, poster publicly like that, so Klimt added these tree trunks. So we're actually seeing the censored version um, of the poster. But there are rare survivals of the uncensored version, um, and we sometimes show both of them side by side, or we'll just show one or show the other. But the, the poster then was released. And he borrowed elements from the design for the um, catalog cover for the first Vienna Secession exhibition, and you can see in the postcard show upstairs how this motif was also used for one issue of Versace. Room. Now, members of the Vienna Secession also designed a series of postcards, including the one shown at the right, and we have two of those artist postcards up in the exhibition as well. And as these items attest, the Secession favored artistically designed graphics, not only posters, catalogs, magazines, and postcards, but they really saw this as part of the entire Gesamtkunstwerk program of the Secession. And many of these works, um, you will notice, maybe it's not so evident in, this, in these slides, although perhaps you can see, Gustav Klimt's name is there at the bottom of that one. And you will see in some of the postcards, either the artist's name is written out or their initials are incorporated. So this demonstrates that for them, they did view these as works of fine art and that they were very proud of these designs. And these attitudes would be carried over um, when the Wiener, Wiener Werkstätte was established. Um, just a few years after the founding of the secession. So shortly after the first secession exhibition, in fact, a um, group of 12 artist postcards or Kunstler postcards was released in 1898, and these were produced by the art printer Gerlach and Schenk um, by designs of members of the secession. Um, these were these designs were provided not only by architect Josef Hoffmann and Coleman Moser, who I've already mentioned, but Alfred Roller, Adolf Bohm, and Josef Maria Ulbrich, all of who would be involved either with the Wiener Werkstätte. Ulbrich would go on to work with the Darmstadt colony, um, so another very important arts group at the time. 
And I just would draw your attention to the fact that if you think about other postcards you might have seen from the early 19th or 20th century, how here there's tremendous emphasis given on the aesthetics of the postcard. So graphic elements are very carefully laid out. Typography is chosen to sort of work with the visual image. It's not just block sans serif lettering or something like that, but it's really carefully placed. And in some of the cards from this Kunstler postcard series, there is even dramatic areas of blank space left um, which you could read as a place that the sender might add a note, or maybe just as kind of a, a visual pause um, that was part of the designer's concept. These artists, in fact, had prior experience working in the postcard medium, but be because before the secession had been established, they were part of a kind of coffee house club in Vienna known as the Siebner Club or Club of Seven. And they would meet together um, for a number of years, I'm sure, talking about their plans before they finally got fired up and decided to establish the secession. And they frequently communicated about their ideas by sending postcards to each other with these quick sketches um, and notes added in. And you can see there what I mean about how they would use that blank space um, to, to uh, work to their effort, their benefit um, with the design of the card. Now, one of the most successful examples of artist design postcards, and one that in fact made the career in many ways of German painter Emil Nolde in terms of giving him his start, was his group of so called Magic Mountain postcards. And these were inspired by his experiences walking in the Swiss Alps. And based on that, he had submitted some sketches to a Munich based art journal known as Die Jugend or the Youth. And some of these designs were reproduced in the magazine, and these humorous works quickly found an audience. And Nolde capitalized on this interest by creating color lithographic postcards that were adaptations of these paintings. And they were printed in large print runs. It said over 100,000 um, per image. And the overwhelming um, response to these cards was somewhat unexpected. Expressionist scholar Peter Seltz wrote about Nolde's breakthrough postcard designs, and I quote, their crude and simple anti-art quality, which made no demands on intellect or aesthetic sensibility, so captured public taste that the edition was exhausted in 10 days, earning Nolde 20,000 Swiss francs. And as soon as he could, he gave up his teaching job and left for Munich to become a full-time student of painting. Um, so that really says something about the power of the postcard. Um, and perhaps I would argue the runaway success of these cards led not only the secession and Wiener Werkstatt artists, but other artists in Europe and the United States and elsewhere to really um, realize the potential of this medium. Now, the men who would go on to found the Wiener Werkstatt may have discussed their plans for an artist collaborative as early as 1900, when that eighth Vienna secession exhibition was held. And by 1902, Hoffman Moser and the Scottish designer Charles Rennie Mackintosh were engaged by Fritz Verndorfer. We see him here on the left in his wedding photo to outfit the interiors of his villa. Verndorfer was a major patron of modern art and close friends with many members of the Vienna Secession. And he wrote um, Hoffman in 1902, saying, sometimes when I look over my things, I think the Secession was founded for me alone. Um, we know that his collection included Klimt uh, paintings, sculptures by the Belgian artist Georg Minna, prints by Aubrey Beardsley, and many other Secession artists um, had works that were incorpor incorporated in their home. Um, and by uh, March of 1903, clearly, Verndorfer, Hoffman, and Moser had spent a lot of time talking about their plans um, for this workshops because Verndorfer writes Macintosh asking for his advice on their idea to establish a metal workshop. And Macintosh replied, saying, If one wishes to achieve artistic success, then every object you release must be most definitely marked by individuality, beauty, and the utmost accuracy of execution. And while this certainly applies to the metalwork and all of the other objects that the Wiener Werkstätter produced, it also applies to the postcards, as humble as they might have appeared in their paper um, medium. Now, according to one version of events, the Wiener Werkstätter was officially born in one of Vienna's famous coffee houses, the Heinrichshof, which we see here on the left. The cafe was and is an integral part of Viennese culture to this day. There are still 
more cafes in Vienna than you could possibly ever experience, and they're popular with tourists and natives um, alike. And it's a place where you can not only have coffee, but also read the paper, have a meal, hang out. Um, the writer Peter Altenberg was said to even receive his mail um, in his most favored coffee house. Um, and artists and writers and politicians all had their favored places, their favorite coffee houses, and probably would not have strayed too far into others from a competing realm. Um, people were so strident in their preferences. But it is said that on you know, one fateful day, Hoffman and Moser were there chatting. Verendorfer joined them. They were talking about this idea to maybe establish this metal workshop. And Verendorfer said, OK, so what will it cost? And Moser said, well, if we had 500 crowns, we'd know just what to do. And Verendorfer, who was very wealthy, pulled the money out and handed it over to them. So Hoffman and Moser quickly then went, rented an apartment. Verendorfer provides more money. Soon they've hired some craftsmen, and they're off on their way. And here, um, these two postcards are both from that series that the Wiener Werkstätte would go on to produce. They didn't actually begin issuing postcards until 1907 and continued with just a short period of interruption until 1920. And over the years, um, 925 individual cards were released by the firm, um, many of which do feature coffee houses and scenes from the empire. Now, the Vienna Workshops, as I said, was founded in 1903, and it really was one of the most important outgrowths of the secession, and they certainly did go on to champion the notion of the Gesamtkunstwerk, just as the secession had itself. And so the Wiener Werkstätte went on to produce not only this first metalwork object that we see here on the left, but they established an architectural office, ultimately a fashion office, as well as the possibilities of making every kind of ceramic, textile, glass, um, book binding, their concept was all inclusive and they didn't feel that anything was too small or too large for their purview. Even their stationery, monograms, invoices, everything was carefully considered and uh, it was really one of the first companies to provide a cohesive graphic identity that would communicate to their public their very strong aesthetic sensibility. By May of 1903, they had registered with the Vienna Trade Ministry as an artisan production cooperative. And at that point, I should emphasize that really part of their goal was it wasn't just that artists would create these beautiful objects, or I should say designs for beautiful objects, but they worked closely with craftsmen to ensure that these objects would be as beautifully realized as the artist had envisioned. So um, within six months of their founding, they realized that the small apartment they had rented was not large enough for their grand ambitions, and so they moved to much larger premises in Vienna's seventh district, where they would remain for the rest of their um, existence until 1932, and they added workshops for all of these other areas that I had mentioned. Now, Hoffman and Moser, with their concept for the workshops, had certainly been looking back to the British arts and crafts example, specifically Charles Robert Ashby's Guild of Handicraft, which had been established in 1888 as a way to um, foster this creative um, and collaborative working environment. And while in Great Britain, many had objected to the rise of industrialization, which uh, a lot of people saw as undermining the role of craftsmen, um, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, things were somewhat different. Industrialization was not quite as widespread, and the goals of the founders of the Wiener Werkstätte did not exactly mirror those of Ashby or other similar arts and crafts workshops. So while Charles Robert Ashby, um, skilled of handicraft, hoped to produce well-made goods that could be affordable to the masses, Hoffman and Moser recognized that if you're producing beautifully designed and well-made products, you know, this is going to come at a price, and in some cases, a very steep price. And in 1905, they issued a working program, what they called um, their, their working program, and we see here the front of that as well as two of the interior spreads. And they state in here part of their manifesto where they say we neither can nor will compete for lowest prices. That is chiefly done at the worker's expense. On the contrary, regard it as our highest duty to return him, meaning the worker, to a position in which he can take pleasure in his labor and lead a life in keeping with human dignity. Um, and that is something that certainly does distinguish them from most other similar workshops that um, took place in the US and in Europe um, at this time. And we can even see the prominence given to the craftsmen in that column in Moser, 
not only designed the logo for the Wiener Werkstätte, the WW, but also the Rolls, Rose Hallmark, which you'll see stamped on some of their products. He also created the monograms for the artists, and we see some of those on these pages, but also monograms for the craftsmen. So many pieces will not only have the logo for the firm and the person who conceived of the design, but often the person who physically made it, not in every case, but in many cases, especially for the expensive items. Now, the same year that the um, working program was issued, there was a major rift in this membership of the secession. And a group of artists centered around Klimt decided they were going to secede from the secession, um, partly because they had a dispute over how exhibitions were being hung and promoted. So it's quite ironic that they actually have to vacate the building that they really helped um, establish. Um, the members who were kind of arguing with the so-called Klimt group felt there was too much emphasis placed on the decorative arts, so that's quite interesting. That's saying that this Gesamtkunstwerk notion was not completely received fully by everyone that was associated with the group. And others objected to the fact that members of the secession were exhibiting and selling their works in commercial galleries. And there were members of the secession that felt that was in violation of the um, group's rules, if not their uh, <coughs> philosophy. So the, the, the Klimt group would go on to found, uh, to mount, I should say, two major um, art exhibitions in Vienna. The first was called the Kunstschau Wien, 1908, um, which was really limited to arts from the empire. In 1909, they would have a kind of sister exhibition, which was the International Kunstschau Wien, which showed arts from throughout Europe. And it was housed in temporary buildings that had been designed by Josef Hoffmann, erected not far from the um, Ringstrasse. There were over 50 um, separate rooms that were in these buildings, and almost 200 artists contributed. And it was a very wide array of art that was shown. So not only a gallery, that which was just the um, most recent paintings by Gustav Klimt, including that golden portrait of Adela Bluck Bauer, but also sculpture, prints, decorative arts, art for children, garden art, theatrical design, graphic art, um, and even a modern cemetery <laughs> was evidently there. Now the Kunstschau Wien um, exhibition, in fact, became the first subjects of the numbered series of postcards, even though they were not the first postcards produced. These were released in 1908, the earliest postcards um, date to 1907, but the series was not issued in a chronological fashion, so you can't take the numbers as a way of judging how they fall within the series. So their, their record keeping was a bit loosey-goosey, um, you might say. Um, these postcards, um, designed by Emil Hoppe, were probably based on photographs because they were released after the show opened in June, um, and uh, clearly based on the, the building designs by Hoffman. Um, Hoppe was also an architect who worked in the decorative arts, um, and I think worked closely with Hoffman on some projects as well. Now, as I, I mentioned, the um, Kunstschau Wien included a room dedicated to the graphic arts, and I'm showing one view of that here. Um, this was primarily poster design, but it also included smaller pieces, and more than 100 of the Wiener Werkstätte postcards were included in this space. So it was certainly a great way, almost simultaneous, with the launch of the postcards for the public to get an opportunity to see these in a very elevated context and to, pro to start beginning postcard collections of their own. And so many of the designers who had posters specifically created for the show, showing one by Bertold Loeffler at the bottom, but Oskar Kokoschka, um, Rudolf Kalvak also created posters specifically to advertise the Kunstschau Wien, many of which still exist in museum collections to this day, and they also created postcards for the Wiener Werkstatt at exactly the same time. So to speak about Kokoschka, um, with the Kunstschau Wien, um, this young kind of rebellious artist really gets his first opportunity through the invitation of Gustav Klimt to begin showing his work really on a grand, at least national, stage. He had studied at the School of Applied Arts from 1904 until 1909, taking classes under Karl Orocheczka, who was one of the leading early designers affiliated with the Wiener Werkstätte until he moves to Hamburg in 1907 to begin teaching at the School of Applied Arts there. And both um, Kokoschka and Loeffler um, contributed designs to the workshop. Kokoschka offered his first postcards in 1907, but he also contributed broadsheets, painted fans, and books. And at the 1908 Kunschau, his book known as the Traubenden Knaben, or Dreaming Youths, was released, um, which really tells a quite personal story through poetry and color lithographs, which was called at the time a picture poem. 
And although it was described as a children's book, it really recounts the artist's juvenile crush on the sister of a fellow art student named Lilith or Lee. And Kokoschka said it was a love letter for Lee. Although only 500 copies were printed of this book, less than half sold, and critics were not so favorable um, in their descriptions and reception to this title. Um, so the title, uh, the book was held back, and some years later it was released, where by this point Kokoschka had a greater reputation, and it was certainly far more popular. Um, Kokoschka, for his work, not only this Dreaming Youth, but other things that he showed at this time, which were more decorative pieces, was dubbed by one critic as the Oberwildling, or Super Savage, because his expressive style of figures with this heavy use of black and this woodcut style in primary colors was seen as being so radical at that period, it wasn't really appreciated for the uh, modernity that it represented in, in many ways. And Kokoschka reacted to this title not by being chagrined, but instead he embraced it. And so he had his head shaved and went around for a while with the shaved head. Um, just to sort of give you some context, shaved heads at this period would really be associated with prisoners, people who were in jail. So it's also giving some sense of how these artists were seen as really kind of being on the fringes of society in many ways. By 1909, Kokoschka was invited to return to the Kunschau and he exhibited some of his oil portraits. Um, these quickly attracted the attention of architect Adolf Loos and we see his portrait by Kokoschka on the right. And Loos was so impressed by Kokoschka's burgeoning talent that he told him, you should stop wasting your talents making these decorative goods and become a painter full time and I will find patrons for you and anyone who doesn't agree to buy your portraits, I will purchase them by myself but for myself. And in fact, um, in the early 20th century, Loos had the largest collection of Kokoschka portraits <laughs> because most of the sitters thought they looked terrible and they didn't want to hang these paintings um, in their houses. Um, so <laughs> that does sort of show just kind of how avant-garde um, and radical um, these works were. So Kokoschka was certainly um, deemed a rebel um, in many ways, and not just against how his art should be made, but also in methods of um, how to teach and approach um, the creation of his art. We know that he liked working with children, whether it was street urchins or circus figures, but basically people who were untrained models, who were not so careful and studied in their poses, who were more nonchalant. Um, we know a little bit also about Kokoschka's working method that he did not insist that someone stand stock still. He had no problems with people moving about, sort of continuing about their, their life while he was there working um, on his canvases. And sometimes it would work directly on canvas without even making sketches in advance. So a quite different approach to how Gustav Klimt worked, who would frequently make hundreds of preparatory sketches and maybe take years working on some of his um, designs. So we see here uh, an early sketch by Kokoschka Will. He's still a student and a contemporary postcard work and we have at least, what, 12 if not more. Uh, he made more than 20 postcard designs for the Wiener Werkstätte and more than a dozen of them are included um, in the exhibition. And I really encourage you to take some time to study these works which feature a wide variety of subjects. So not only holiday cards, whether it's Pentecost, Easter, um, Christmas, New Year type things, but also works that speak to the growing interest in folk art that was emerging um, in Vienna at this time. And we see that quite beautifully, I think, in the Huntsman card and, and the one of this lovely woman um, out in a meadow of flowers. Now, all of Kokoschka's postcard designs for the Wiener Werkstätte tend to favor um, figures posed in expressive um, postures, many of which echo avant-garde choreography, which was emerging in the modern dance movement at this time. And they certainly recall um, the dances of Greta Wiesenthal and her sisters, and we see Greta here on the left. The Wiesenthal sisters, in fact, debuted their innovative, ecstatic style of folk dance, as it was described by some critics at the Cabaret Fluttermouse, and I'll say more about the Cabaret Fluttermouse in a moment. Um, Kokoschka wasn't only just a painter and a decorative artist, but he also wrote expressionist plays and contributed theater pieces to the Fluttermouse himself. Um, his fairy tale play called The Speckled Egg debuted there in 1907. A second play known as The Grotesque performed there in 1909. So we can see that many of these artists were working in different genres. They weren't limited just to one particular realm. 
1908 was a watershed year for Vienna um, in many ways, and it wasn't just that major art show, but in fact, as I had mentioned earlier, it was the 60th Jubilee of the Emperor. He was 78 years old, and the same month that the Kunschau exhibition opened, there was this massive parade that went along the Ringstrasse where people dressed in costumes representing the different ages and nationalities of the empire paraded in front of the emperor, who you can see here kind of on this um, dai on the right. And he, it was said that he insisted on standing for all of the hours that it took for these thousands of people to walk by him. Um, simultaneous um, with the Jubilee, the government issued a postage stamp um, that was um, commissioned by Colm and Moser, and we see that on the left. Um, but also in conjunction with the Jubilee was this wonderful series of postcards um, released by the Wiener Werkstätte itself. And these are among the most striking um, early cards that came out of the workshops with designs by various artists, including Remigius Gehling, Hubert von Zickel, Josef Daivecki, and Bertold Loeffler. And we have a number of these included um, in the exhibition in the first gallery. You can see there's a lot of attention lavished not only in capturing accurately the dress of the people who um, participated in the parade, but as I mentioned, even with those secession cards, we see that the decorative border is also conceived to kind of cohere with the, the style of clothing, but the typography changes appropriately as well. And on the right, um, we see the, uh, some, uh, a man in costume who's very much harking back to the Biedermeier period. And I should mention that for these artists that are establishing the Wiener Werkstätte in particular, they looked very fondly back to the Biedermeier, which had taken place just about 100 years prior, and saw in these very classical, simple forms, in many cases very unadorned, an important source of inspiration for their work. So if you look at some early Wiener Werkstätte um, products, you'll know Notice that those clean, simple lines in many ways echo Biedermeier examples. Now, I had mentioned um, that there was this wonderful uh, cabaret um, that was founded where not only modern dance was performed, but also expressionist plays by Kokoschka and others. This uh, nightclub was known as the Cabaret Fledermaus or Bat Cabaret, which seems an appropriate name for a nightclub. Um, Fritz Berndorfer, who was the financial backer of the Wiener Werkstätte at its founding, had commissioned Hoffman and the other artists associated with the firm to design all of the interiors as well as the furniture, the place settings, even the, cl the, the, the clip that the hostess would wear that would hand you your ticket when you um, went and entered. So we see here, um, I'm showing the postcard view as well as the black and white photo that shows the entry or bar area of the cabaret. And what's quite nice about the postcard is it confirms that these were brightly colored spaces and not these kind of staid um, conservative interiors that we might imagine from only being able to refer to black and white photos. Um, cabaret Fledermaus postcards were designed not only by Josef Hoffman, in fact, they are among the few postcards that he actually dedicated his considerable talents to, but also by Bertolt Loeffler, who had created that great poster um, for the Kunstschau Wien, but also other artists, um, promoting not only the plays themselves and the space, but even some cards were designed to coincide with the performances by modern dancers. Now, Wiener Werkstätte artists not only designed postcards um, for the cabaret, but they also designed the illustrations that would be included in the program inserts. And I'm showing on the right one of those designs that was um, created by Fritz Zamer. And we do have a postcard in the exhibition upstairs that shows a very similar dancing figure. So you can see the kind of echoes um, in the ways that the advertising sort of complemented itself on various levels. Um, as I've already mentioned, this cabaret was not only a place where modern dance took place, but writers could come and read. Um, people such as Peter Altenberg and others were um, popular um, attendees and performers at the venue. And what's quite interesting, I think, is that while this was a period that modern dance and choreography was emerging, many of the leading figures, in fact, being women, ironically, women were just beginning to fight for opportunities to have greater political rights and educational rights. Um, so the arts were really one of the first places where they were able to kind of find their modern voice. So restrictions on what women could do at this time really carried through in various ways, and women coped um, you know, I think by trying to see how far they could push the envelope. 
So while they were unable to study at university in Vienna until the late 19th century, certainly many of the leading society figures, including Adela Block Bauer and others, hosted salons where writers, politicians, artists, musicians, all kinds of people would come and share conversation. So this is one way that you could sort of cope by not being able to have a formal education granted to you. Um, we also know that because of the rise of industrialization, even though it was not quite as widespread in Vienna, there was this emerging class of wealthy collectors who wanted to outfit their home as beautifully as they could afford, but they also wanted to see their children educated even better than they had been. So there began to be demands to allow women to go to get these higher degrees, but also demands for universal suffrage. So universal suffrage for men in Austria was not enacted until 1906. Women received universal suffrage in 1918. And really, I would say these kind of simultaneous rights um, met greater opportunities for education, open up to them as well. So they first began entering the University of Vienna in 1897, and they start studying at the Kunstgewerbeschule um, under Hoffmann and Moser in 1899. And this uh, great photo is um, showing the director of the Kunstgewerbeschule with some of the female students wearing these wonderful reform style dresses, even with that checkerboard style pattern, which you see on a lot of universities set of objects. Many of these young women would then go on to create designs for the workshops. Ironically, um, in the early years that the workshop was founded, most of the products offered by them, even though they were intended for women in many cases, were designed by men. <laughs> um, in 1905, they start first producing um, textiles, which were hand printed and painted silks, which were made in house, but they soon realized that they want, need to produce these on a much larger scale and for interior projects. So they start working with Johann Backhausen and Son. And we have on display in the exhibition a number of really beautiful textile designs on loan from the Wolfsonian Museum. And I hope you'll take the time to look at those and compare them to the textiles, uh, the postcards, brother. In 1910, they realized that you know this is a great opportunity, these textiles, and they could begin offering full ensembles in fashion. So they um, promote Edward Joseph Wimmer Viskerl, who'd been working with the workshop since 1906, to be the head of the fashion department, and they even dub him the architect of fashion. He had studied under Hoffman at the Kunstgewerbeschule and um, was sent to kind of man their Carlsbad branch, and there's a great oversized photo blow up at the start of the exhibition, which I hope you'll take time to study in greater detail. This is showing a, a slightly cropped view, but if you look at that blow up, you can see that right here is a great array of some of the postcards as well as some of the other early products um, of the Wiener Werkstätte. And at this place, they not only sold those postcards and ceramics and metalworks, but also a lot of accessories because Carlsbad was an important spa or resort town. So it's completely natural that they would want to have things on offer here that would be appealing to the female clients. The Wiener Werkstätte first receives a tailor's license in March of 1911, and they held their fashion show um, the following month in April, which featured dresses designed by Hoffman and by Wimmer. And critical response to these works was incredibly favorable. Many critics, in fact, recognizing that now with all of the things that the workshops offered, you really could have fully complete ensembles from your hat, your jewelry, your shoes, et cetera. As I had mentioned, Wimmer was designated as the architect of fashion, and they even made special labels for clothes that he had designed, which had that abbreviation for architect Wimmer. Um, Hoffman, who actually was the more prolific architect by a wide degree, um, preferred to call himself Professor Hoffman, which I think is quite interesting. And he even signed a lot of his sketches with that professor um, kind of title. And I think this points to the sort of idealistic and undercurrents which were affecting the management of the workshops at this time, that they really wanted to distinguish kind of how they, they viewed themselves despite the way they actually practiced. Now, inspiration for Wiener Werkstatt of Fashion came from various sources, including artistic um, reform clothing, which was emerging um, in Vienna, most particularly through salons like the Schwestern Fluge Fashion Salon, which offered reform dresses, but there were other similar boutiques um, available. But the Austrians also looked to French um, couture designs for inspiration as well. Now, at this period, many reformers 
argued against the corset, saying that it was poor for your health, it restricted your ability to move, and as women were certainly emerging into the workplace, they needed to have greater freedom of movement, but also a new silhouette was falling into fashion at this time, so that high, tightly pinched wasp waist um, was kind of quickly falling out of favor. And we can see um, both through illustrations that are in the show, but also if you look at books on the subject, that many of the Wiener Werkstätter postcards, and I'm showing one here on the left by Mela Kohler, directly mirror um, photographic fashions that the Wiener Werkstätter released in conjunction with that fashion show. And many of these early dresses are in this neo ampere style with the um, kind of invisible waist or very high waist, the very kind of tight um, bodice area. And in walking through the Italian style exhibition um, with Linda Klitsch, we were very taken by the fact that the Audrey Hepburn gown um, on display from War and Peace is in exactly this type of style of fashion. So if you want to imagine what one of those dresses would look in three dimension, I urge you to go and kind of make that juxtaposition in your own mind. I think what's also interesting is that if you look at the early postcards and compare them with the photographs, in many cases the postcard sketches are far more flattering to the figures. Um, clearly when they first begin making these, they come across far more like sack dresses. So there is really no sense of you know, the feminine um, form in these early uh, dresses that were actually turned out by the workshops. But as they get greater fluidity with making these, and perhaps after consulting with some real tailoring experts, um, the style of their clothing really does begin to improve. In 1911, French fashion designer Paul Poiret actually visited the city in November, and he purchased a number of Wiener Werkstätter fabrics and also products, and would bring these back to Paris with him. And this sort of sparked a slight sea shift See shift in um, Parisian designs as they begin to show an Austrian or Viennese influence in the years thereafter. And in fact, Poiret would even establish a kind of arts and crafts workshop known as the Studio Martin that was in many ways modeled after the Wiener Werkstätte, where he used young female students to create um, goods, particularly for women. So it shows that it wasn't just the more sophisticated Parisians, you know, showing the Viennese how fashion should really be done. Many critics, in fact, um, showed some trepidation when they heard that Poirier might come with his fashion show because he was certainly seen as a competitor and there was a lot of nationalistic rivalry between the French and the Austrians at this time. One critic was pointing out, trying to sort of boost the morale of the Viennese, saying, well, the Viennese are prettier and they're more buxom and the Parisians don't have any hips. <laughs> um, so, you know, who, who knows how strongly they really took these uh, competitive vibes. Um, and when Poiret was actually interviewed about how practical his fashions would be for, you know, a, a society woman of the day and whether or not his unusual costumes and light colored shoes would, would work for a woman who actually might have to go out onto the street. He said the ladies I dress don't go onto the street. <laughs> so it was also kind of, I think, him trying to say, well, my women don't work. These are wealthy women who, you know, essentially have lunch and have tea and don't soil themselves with, you know, these kind of concerns that you Austrians are arguing about. But Wimmer was clearly influenced by Port A's visit, and we can see in his postcard designs, even though he was the architect of fashion and head of the fashion branch for, gosh, um, I think a dozen years before he comes to the United States, he only releases, I think it's 10 postcards. So perhaps he was too busy <laughs> making um, uh, fashion sketches for things that would be produced and actually overseeing the management of the branch. But it's a nice juxtaposition, I think, uh, with one of the Vimmer cards, and you can see this and many others by Vimmer um, in the display upstairs. And you can see that he's emulating that kind of sultana type of design that Poiré had released just at this period. Now, Wimmer's strength as a designer really was in the area of fashion, not in architecture, although he did work in other media too. And um, interestingly enough, Wimmer came to the United States and taught at the Art Institute of Chicago for a couple of years between 1922 and 1924 before he decided this was really not the place for him to be. And he returned um, to Vienna and continued to teach there until he retired in the mid-1950s. We also know that he spent some time visiting the New York branch 
branch of the Wiener Werkstätte, and there's a great photo showing one of the interiors of that branch. And he was very disheartened because everyone had hoped that this branch in America would bring you know, more money and recognition to the workshops, but he was sad to see that there weren't a lot of customers milling about and things weren't selling as well as they had hoped and people weren't buying large quantities of things, but maybe only singular items. I'm showing here two of his um, postcard designs, um, which are included in the catalog and in the show. But certainly as prolific and as ambitious as Wimmer was as an artist, the workshop uh, fashion branch would not have been so successful if there hadn't been many other talented people behind it. And many of those people were in fact women. Mayla Kohler being one of the most notable um, artists who was uh, involved with that effort. She was the most prolific postcard designer creating more than 150 um, designs total many in the area of fashion, but not exclusively in the area of fashion. She also did children's postcards, humor postcards, holiday postcards, and we have a, a number of those on display in the exhibition. And you can see that she really lavishes a lot of interest on the, um, the silhouette of the person and a lot of detail, you know, showing here the muff, the um, part of the shoe and the hat. So really trying to, I think, convey, convey to a female client what you would look like if you had acquired the entire ensemble. Um, and I think it's great to see the photo of her dressed in a very similar way on the right. Some of her fashion designs we know um, correspond directly to clothes that were made and survive, including on the right, uh, a blouse that was probably designed by Hoffman or Wimmer, and with beautiful folk style embroidery um, at the neck and at the sleeves. And the related um, postcard here on the left, this was part of a series that she did in these women dressed in these sheath style silhouettes, accompanied by small, very cute little dogs. Um, and with these kind of splotchy uh, background that to me uh, makes me think so much of how Vogue or some other leading women's fashion magazine today would create these almost artistic style backdrops to make the clothes stand out even more so. She also created a postcard that really um, reflects, as I mentioned, the interest in Biedermeier fashion. So these would not have been clothes that would have necessarily um, been worn to a large degree, although we are aware that there were garden parties and other kind of special events where women who kind of allied themselves with Biedermeier values would order clothes in this Biedermeier style, even though it would have been deemed very old fashioned at this time. I'm not aware if these dresses really corresponded to things that the Wiener Werkstätte itself made, but it certainly was speaking to the um, prevailing interest by many of their uh, patrons at this time. And on the right is one of her uh, most humorous, I think, um, holiday postcards um, for New Year's, where we see a, a woman in this really elegant dress surrounded by pigs of various size that are being fattened up um, for good luck. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to also make mention to the fact that there are many variations in the postcards. Um, cards would differ sometimes not only in their size, but also in the colors that they might be printed in. And this could be due to the fact that the workshops um, collaborated with three different printers and the cards could be issued over a period of years. The holiday cards were among the most popular and so would be reissued on a more regular basis than some of those artist design cards that might have only been issued one time and in an edition of perhaps only a hundred or a few hundred as opposed to a thousand or a few thousand. Also what's quite interesting is that often the note at the bottom um, would appear in German or in English. Um, Linda mentioned that there are cards that survive in French. We don't have any of those in the show, but it is quite interesting to see that they did recognize that they had a French market. We do have some in the exhibition that have um, writing in Cyrillic. Um, so that's, uh, I think, somewhat of a surprise as well, that they saw that their audience really extended quite far beyond the realm of the Austro-Hungarian Empire itself. Uh, Mayla Kohler also designed series of postcards devoted not only to women in sport, which we see on the right, and a few of which are included in the exhibition, but also things that were to appeal to children, showing girls of uh, various age, from very young to almost teenagers, playing with um, different dolls. And I think this speaks to the fact that the new woman, um, kind of as a, a type, was emerging um, even prior to women granting, uh, being granted full suffrage. Some of the most beautiful cards that Mela Kohler um, created and that are among the most collectible are these oversized um, hat postcards in the square shape, 
Um, these were not intended to be mailed, but would have been something that collectors really tried to get the entire series for. And we know that the workshops even made frames, some with a simple black wood profile, and some, as I understand it, that were just glass that had clips um, so that it could be closed together, but there wouldn't be any frame around the card itself. It could just hang on your wall. So this also emphasizes the fact that at this time, these were appreciated as miniature works of art and were also promoted directly to appeal to collectors. Maya Kohler was not the only artist who was extremely gifted in the area of women's fashion. Maria Lickhartz had also studied at the School of Applied Arts under Hoffman and other artists who were affiliated with the workshops. And um, kind of on the back of the case that has only Maya Kohler cards, we do have some of Maria Lickhartz's designs, including this wonderful one um, in this beautiful patterned um, dress or jacket, um, wearing this fanciful hat. Lickhart's not only made a number of um, fashion postcards, but also cards related to carnival and ball subjects, as well as holiday designs. Perhaps the most striking um, series of cards produced by Maria Lickhart's coincide with the um, formation of the Ballet Russe. Ballet Russe had been established in Paris in 1909 by Sergei Diaghilev, and it toured Vienna on numerous occasions, including in 1912 and 1913, and it really sparked an interest in Orientalist design. The German magazine Deutsche Kunst und Dekoration published an article in conjunction with the Ballet Russe coming to Vienna, and it very clearly inspired not only Lickhart's with her postcards um, really mirroring some of the costumes that were created by Leon Bosques for those Ballet Russe um, performances, but even Vimmer starts making sketches um, for the workshops that, that echo that kind of exotic Orientalist Thousand and One Nights kind of folktale um, aspiration. Um, fashion certainly was one of the major areas that the Wiener Werkstätte um, covered. So, so far we've seen, you know, things that relate directly to events or places in Vienna. We've seen some of the holiday cards, we've seen some fashion cards. So many of these were clearly geared toward a more feminine clientele, but they also um, created humor cards and other things that are perhaps somewhat harder to quantify, but that would have had a broader based appeal. And one of the artists who worked in some of those other areas outside of fashion was Moritz Jung. I think he was one of the most gifted um, in this kind of satirical style of humor. He had studied at the School of Applied Arts um, and demonstrated really strong talent in the area of graphic design. He begins offering works to the Wiener Werkstätte as early as 1907, um, specifically for Cabaret Fledermouse and some of the workshop's other activities, including characters of some of the performers who appeared at the Cabaret. And Jung provided more than 70 postcard designs for the workshops, um, many of which, as I said, show this blend of humor and satire. So on the left, we have one from a series he did all about conversation um, or communication, and I might say miscommunication, because we see these sort of funny misunderstandings that take place. So I'm showing conversation between mutes, but there are some other really humorous ones um, in the show and a few additional ones you can see in the catalog. And on the right is um, one from a whole series he did called Variety Acts, which are these imaginary, um, bizarre <laughs> variety acts. So here we see a, a kind of a genius virtuoso and an embryonic state um, playing a violin. But there are others, um, including a man who fasts until he becomes a skeleton, and others who's a daredevil artist who flies on a, a broom-like thing. Um, and to see all of these, there's uh, maybe I mentioned there's a, a really great book available um, in the Frisk bookstore that has the complete run of all the cards in color. Jung also designed a series of cards on Vienna's cafe culture, and we saw some of those at the beginning um, of the talk. Um, one of his most famous series of cards um, is this series devoted to airplanes. Um, Jung may have been inspired, in fact, by the work of a fellow Austrian. Ego Ertrich debuted his monoplane um, in 1909, and it was first flown in 1910, and went on to be used not only for civilian, but also military purposes. And I was quite excited to find this photo showing the first class of students from the Austro-Hungarian Royal and Imperial, or Ka Ka, <laughs> um, flying school, which was located just north, uh, sorry, south of Vienna in the Wiener Neustadt, um, so with an airplane. 
But a another certainly um, probably more significant airplane um, uh, event that took place for Vienna was that Louis Blériot, the, the Frenchman, had flown over Vienna in 1909, and it was said that more than 300,000 people came out to witness Blériot's flights, including the emperor himself, whom Blériot even got to meet. So I think this helped spark this kind of imagination for this new technological you know, flying machine and the possibilities that it could provide. But it wasn't just you know, uh, those humorous kind of imagining things. There were also postcards that re reflect kind of daily life in Vienna or leisure activities in Vienna. And one of these uh, series that's, I think, among the most appealing is this group that Edelberte Kiesewetter did um, dedicated to the Schönbrunn Zoo. The Schönbrunn Zoo had been um, established kind of as an uh, imperial or monarchical menagerie in the mid-18th century. Um, and it was created under the Emperor Franz, um, Francis I, who was the husband of Maria Theresa. And very quickly, it was open to the public, and they began acquiring these exotic animals from all over the globe, including an elephant, polar bear. And when they acquired their first giraffes in 1828, it sparked this mad craze for everything giraffe-inspired in Vienna. So you see giraffe fabrics. Um, incorporated in clothing, in upholstery, uh, upholstery. They even, I think, made giraffe-like hats for women, um, cakes, plays. So here we see that that kind of giraffe fascination certainly carried over even into the early 20th century. Um, and in fact, the zoo remains one of the most popular tourist attractions even now. Now, most of the Wiener Werkstätte postcards that we've looked at and that are included in the exhibition were created actually within a very short window of time, six years, in fact, between 1907, when those first cards were issued, and 1913. So with the outbreak of World War I, perhaps these items and certainly other things that the Wiener Werkstätte had been creating were deemed to be too frivolous for the seriousness of the times. Um, is one way to express it. I think also one of the things that Linda and I had independently kind of worked out was the, the cost of these cards. So if a typical card at this time might have only been a few cents or a cent or, or even less, these cards were probably at least in what today would be worth a dollar or more depending on the rate of inflation and when you purchased it. So they were many, many, many more times expensive uh, than the cost of, of a standard postcard. So people would have maybe thought twice about you know, using their spare change in this way. Also with the outbreak of war, tourism was drastically reduced. And you know, there's no denying the fact that many of the artists and craftsmen who were employed by the workshops were conscripted to go and fight. And some of them did lose their lives on the battlefields. So specifically, I can mention four of the postcard designers who died during the hostilities. These were Urban Janka, Moritz Jung, whose works we just saw, Gustav Kalhammer, and Hans Kalmsteiner all died during World War I. And this is part of why women began working in the workshops. It's not just that they now have the education and the opportunity afforded to them, but also the workshops needed people to create designs and help with the management of those workshops. After the war ended, a kind of second, very short life series is issued, 1919-1920, with designs by two women, again, students of the, the Kunstgewerbeschule, uh, Fritzi Liu, and you can see her works. Um, there's one on the left, but you can see more of them in the catalog, and Hilda Yesser. And in the exhibition is also a really beautiful kind of jewelry case that she designed at the same time um, as these postcards on loan from the Wolfsonian. So you can get a sense of, of her um, artistic sensibility, but also how the workshops was trying to cope in very creative ways with the lack of materials that they had at their disposal, and also the fact that their clients would have had less money at their disposal in order to purchase some of their fanciful designs. Now, almost all of the cards that we have seen today in this presentation, except for those early cards, really fall within what is known as the golden age of postcard collecting, which is generally accepted as extending from the mid-1890s um, until the outbreak of World War I. And these cards, um, as I said, were, you know, many of these cards were so popular, they were printed many times 
Um, some were judged to be so obscure that they would not have been reprinted at all, and there's even one in the exhibition that it is believed was never sent to anyone because none survived with a stamp or a postmark. But one person that we know was a huge fan, not only of Wienerberg's set of postcards, but postcards in general, was the artist Gustav Klimt. And in fact, there is a book that is just dedicated to the correspondence that he sent to Emilia Fluge that reproduces um, the, the cards with translations in English and German, because his handwriting can be very difficult to read. Klimt would send Fluge um, sometimes many postcards in one day. Um, and we see here on the left a postcard that he sent her while she was in Paris, actually attending French couture shows. This was the third card that he sent her on October 3rd, 1909. I think he was missing her really tremendously. She was his closest friend, his sister-in-law, his muse, um, perhaps more, perhaps less, but we know they had an extremely close relationship. And when he was on his deathbed, he called for her. Um, but when he's in this particular card, he makes a joke to her saying, maybe I'll write you postcards all day. It's possible this won't be the last. And in fact, it wasn't. He wrote her two other ones just that day alone. Um, and many of these do survive and are in museum collections and are among the most treasured um, artifacts um, by Klimt um, since none of his diary or almost none of his diaries survive. These miniature works of art really serve both to advertise the products that the Wiener Werkstatt had created, but also as an inexpensive way for the workshops to really spread their concepts of good design to a very broad and wide international audience. They also provide, I think, a wonderful glimpse into the zeitgeist of early 20th century and demonstrate the incredible charms um, of the city, but also the talents of its designers. And I'm showing here an interior view of their branch on the Graben, which was really kind of like the Madison Avenue of Vienna at that period and still functions that way today, where you can see them kind of stacked up in this ziggurat style. And so I hope that the show and my talk might inspire you to go and purchase some postcards from the Frist um, gift store and send those out and not just limit your communications to your friends and family only to text messages or Facebook posts. So really, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.